You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Luke's English Podcast. I'm saying good morning because it's the morning here where I am while I'm recording this. It's the morning. Maybe it's not the morning where you are. Uh, it could be, well, one of the other times of the day, maybe the afternoon or the evening or just the middle of the night. If it's not the morning where you are, then, you know, maybe, you know, you could just pause this and then wait until it is the morning and then just press play again. So that when I say good morning to you at the beginning, it makes sense. Okay? Yes. So there was a point to, to this uh, podcast. Um, and the point, well, one of the points for this episode, one of my objectives was just to kind of talk um, randomly like this and see what happens. Um, that's one of the objectives of the episode. But one of the other objectives was to tell you a story. Okay? tell you a story and I'm going to start telling the story in a moment just as an introduction to the story um, let me tell you a little bit about it um, okay so this is a story I'm going to tell you and I'm uh, it's a kind of a challenge for me again I'm going to try and tell you a story which um, um, whew, I'll tell you a story which I hope you will enjoy and um, basically I haven't planned this story so I'm making it up as I go along. Um, I hope that you're going to find it funny. And I think I'm just going to start the story now. Oh yeah, I'm going to try and make it as long as possible. That's it. I'm going to try and make the story as long as I can. Let's see how long I can make this story. Okay, I'm going to also try and throw in some characters into the story. Um, so you'll, you might hear some different accents and different characters. But just bear in mind the fact that I've got no idea really where the story is going. I'm just making it all up as I go along. So bear that in mind. If the story doesn't make a lot of sense, then I apologise. But hopefully you'll enjoy it, and hopefully it will be very good practice for your ears. Um, OK, so let's begin the story, shall we? Yes, let's begin the story. All right. So you're just going to just take a couple of breaths. Just take a deep breath. OK. The story, here we go. So I'm going to tell you a story about my life. It's not true. It's just made up, okay? Just to be clear, it's just completely made up. Right, so a few years ago, well, um, let's see, a few years ago, I um, was living in London and uh, I, I hit some hard times. Uh, life got a bit difficult for me. Um, I lost my job because um, I was just too good at it. Um, my boss said to me, Luke, can I have a word with you, please? Uh, I was in the middle of a lesson at the time I was teaching. I was saying, so the present perfect tense is a tense which is used when the action is, is finished, possibly, but the time period is not finished. And also, but there is an exception to that rule, and my boss just came into the, the room. Um, it, uh, excuse me, Luke. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, class. Hello, students. The students were like, uh, hello because they're Spanish. Um, hello, uh, Luke, can I have a word with you, please? Um, and so I had, I had to say, sorry, class, just, you know, do page three of, of English grammar in use. Um, just do it, okay? Do it, shut up. Don't, don't give me any back chat. Maybe that's why I lost my job, because I used to tell the students to shut up. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I never, ever tell my students to shut up because as an English language teacher you can't do that that's like one of the worst things you can do it's worse to tell the student to shut up than it is to tell them to fuck off actually um, because shut up is just like the rudest thing you can say in a language classroom in my opinion anyway so I said okay students you know what just um, just do some work alright I'll be back in a minute I've got to speak to the boss Obviously, he's got something very important to say to me because I'm kind of a big deal around here, okay? So do, do some work. See you in a minute. So I went out, and the boss said to me, Luke, um, uh, listen, uh, I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to let you go. I said, what, you're going you're gonna to have to let me go? Yeah, I'm afraid so. We're going we're gonna to have to let you go because um, 
Well, quite frankly, um, you can't just give students pages from English grammar and use and tell them to shut up and, and do it. You can't do that, okay? Because, um, why? well, why not? Why can't I do that? Well, because uh, I don't really know why, but... Th- I just, I just know, I just know that you can't do that. Um, I don't know. I, my training years ago told me something about the fact that, yeah, you should pr- try and use communicative methods. Uh, you should try and engage the students in speaking exercises. You should give them regular feedback, and just don't tell them to shut up or, or fuck off. Okay, it's just a, a general rule, a rule of thumb for, for well, for life. Don't tell people to shut up or to, you know. Uh, so, you know, I'm afraid, Luke, we're going to have to let you go. Um, so, sorry, pack your bags, get out, you're fired. Um, so, obviously, I was devastated. I was like, wow, my God, I'm fired. <laughs> I love my job. And then I realized, wait a minute, I can just do what the hell I want now. Sure, I won't have money or food, but I'll have my freedom. <laughs> Um, and so I went back into class and I said, okay, everyone, well, um, it's been a pleasure, uh, teaching you. I've been Luke Thompson. Um, I still am. Uh, and I, I really hope that you learn this language effectively and you go out there and improve the economy. Okay. Good luck. I've been fired. Um, don't, you know, don't, uh, don't act too upset about that. Hello. Are you actually listening? Hello? Um, Yeah, I'm going now, okay? I'm going. Yeah, fine. Okay, if you don't care, that's that's fine. Um, In fact, there were... Once the students understood the situation, they were like, What? What? You're going? Where? uh, uh, How? Why? How? Well, on foot, probably. Why? Why? I've been fired. My boss just fired me because I told you to, to shut up, remember? Oh, but Luke, you didn't mean it. It was, hey, Luke, hey. For some reason, my students are all um, from Brooklyn. But hey, Luke, you didn't mean it. Now, come on, what's the matter with you? All my students were from New York, uh, Brooklyn, or the Bronx, and they were all Italian-Americans, which is kind of strange, I know. But um, this is all part of the uh, mafia training program that they have over there. Um, they have like a special mafia training uh, budget which they can spend on things like, you know, um, methods of um, threatening people, money counting techniques, and also English lessons. And so all my students were Latin, were, were Italian American gangsters. Hey, Luke, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Huh? Come on, what's the matter with you? You be fired. Screw this guy. Who is this guy? Huh? Come on. Um, and um, so I said, look, look, guys, I'm really sorry. You know, uh, good luck with all of the, you know, assassinations and the robberies and and the extortion. Good luck with that. But I'm out of here. Okay. See you guys later. And they're like, hey, Luke, come on, get out of here. Go, go out of here. Go away. Um, so that's it. So I went out into the street, took a breath of fresh air. Started coughing <coughs> because you know this was London and uh, Oxford Street. It's not exactly fresh air, is it? No, it's not. It's not really. Um, and so I, that's it. I had my freedom. So I just started walking the streets. Just started walking around. Um, just walking around. You know, moving one foot in front of the other. Uh, right foot first, usually, then the left foot, and just repeating that motion. And sort of, I don't know quite how we change direction while we're walking. I think there's subtle movements of the legs to the left and the right, which allow us to turn. Um, But I would basically do that, a lot of that, all over London. Walking around, looking at the sights. You know, I got to, uh, I got to see uh, some of the most amazing sights in London. Um, McDonald's, Starbucks, um, um, just the corner of Oxford Street, um, H&M, um, just some of London's most famous attractions. Um, let's see, what else was there? There was um, Boots, The Chemist, Marks and Spencer, and of course things like Buckingham Palace um, and um, Big Ben, the London Eye, all of these things that I just couldn't afford to to actually visit. 
Uh, but I looked at them and I thought, this, this, Luke, this is London. And, um, and it was, um, because, uh, because I was in London. Yes. Now, moving the story on, okay, so I would, I would move, I would walk around the streets uh, all day and all night just thinking, what's going what's gonna to happen to me? I'm homeless. I'm hungry. I would go into supermarkets um, and just, just stare at food because I didn't have any money to, to buy the food. So I would just stare at all of the food on the shelves and just eat, just eat sandwiches with my eyes you know, um, 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 and just eat them with my eyes. But it wasn't very satisfying because, as you probably know, as you probably have learned in your life, you can't, you can't eat sandwiches with your eyes. You can't really eat anything with your eyes, I think, uh, as far as I know. No, I don't think you can eat anything with your eyes, but I tried. Oh, boy, did I try. I tried to eat, um, you know, mushrooms, uh, uh, spaghetti, um, pretty much all the food. I tried to eat it with my eyes, but no matter how, tr- how hard I tried, I just couldn't eat any of the food with my eyes. So, um, so sometimes I had to steal. I had to steal. I'm, you know, I admit it. Um, I was desperate. I was hungry, um, and uh, so I stole um, a banana. Um, and uh, so I would go to these supermarkets and steal bananas. I found that bananas were the most effective um, fruit to steal. Because what you can do is you just take the banana, and then as soon as you've got the banana in your hand, you just pretend that, that uh, you're receiving a, a telephone call. Um, so you have the banana in your hand, and you just go... Oh, looks like I'm uh, getting a call here on my yellow mobile phone. And then you just sort of bring the, f- the banana up to your, your ear um, and just start talking. Yep, yeah, hello? Yes, 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 it's, yes, it's me. Yes, well, that's right. Um, how can I help you? This is the banana hotline. Um, how can I help you? Yes, yes, I think so. Yes, you should. Um, no, I, no, you shouldn't really. No, you shouldn't really do that with a banana. No, no, no. I know, I know, that, I know the shape of the banana makes you think that you could do that but seriously you shouldn't because well it's bananas are a bit too soft actually for that despite the the shape they're too soft so you shouldn't do it no you shouldn't put it in there no because it, it, it it's too soft you might not be able to get it out right okay no no put it in your mouth that's right eat it eat it that's what you're supposed to do with a banana okay good and then i would just keep talking like this on the banana phone and walk out of the supermarket with the banana to my ear and all of the staff in the in the shop would look at me and they were like uh what's going on what's going on there oh it's just a man talking on a mobile phone no, nothing to see here and i would just walk out of the shop with the banana phone like that and then i would uh have a banana but sometimes what i would do is i'd try i'd forget that it was a banana and i i would think that uh, uh i was like making a telephone call I'd, I'd try and call um you know i'd try and call my parents on the banana and then after after half an hour of attempting to make a telephone call on a banana i would realize and go oh my god what am i doing and then i then i'd eat the banana and it would be okay um, so that's how I survived. I just moved from supermarket to supermarket doing the banana phone trick um, until eventually, you know, I was desperate. I'd, I'd, I, I'd, you know, I just couldn't eat bananas anymore. I was sick of them. Um, and it uh, doesn't, didn't matter how many times I tried to call the banana hotline, no one answered. And because it didn't exist, it didn't even exist. It was all in my imagination. Um, so I started begging on the streets and I would sort of sit on the street and say, excuse me, excuse me, sir. Can you spare 10 P? I'm hungry and I'm thirsty and I'm, I'm a cockney for some reason there. Can you, can you spare me 10 P? Governor, for a cup of tea. Um, for some reason, the Cockney accent helped. Um, people were like, oh, it's just a poor, a poor young Cockney. Um, maybe um, a, a, a chimney sweep or something. And he, oh, he needs some money because he, he's hungry. So, excuse me, squire, you couldn't spare a couple of pans for a dear old Cockney. He's got nothing, no money to his name. And they would, like, give me some money and I'd go down to... Um, Marks and Spencer and buy some quality sandwiches um, okay so that's how I'd survive and then one day one day this um, strange looking gentleman 
approached me in the street. Strange looking gentleman. He was dressed in um, like a, a, a suit. He was dressed in a suit with a top hat. He had a, a, a monocle. That's like a, a, a um, like a, uh, you know, like a pair of glasses, but with only one lens. And you kind of hold it in your eye. So he had one of those, he had a monocle and a moustache and a, and a top hat and a suit. And he was like a very um, posh gentleman. And he came up to me and he said, Excuse me, young gentleman. Um, young beggar. Uh, I was young at the time. Beggar. Uh, Mr. Beggar. I don't know what your name is. I'm going to call you Mr. Beggar. I, I'm using Mr. as a polite term of respect. Mr. Beggar, how can I help you? You seem hungry. You seem desperate and tired. Would you like a job? And um, I said to him, wow, that's, that's amazing. Uh, first of all, my name's Luke. And he said, oh, Luke, thank you, thank you. It's, it's, you know, I always think that it's good to be on first name terms with um, homeless people. Um, and so I said, yeah, I'd love a job. What's, what's, what's the job? And he said, come with me to my mansion in North London and I will show you everything. And I said, you're going to show me everything? Like, everything? He said, no, 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 don't misunderstand, Luke. Please don't misunderstand. I'm going to show you everything related to this job offer. Oh, right. Okay, great. Well, let's go. Let's go to North London. So we immediately, I don't, uh, his name was, um, let's see, what was his name? I said to him, excuse me, um, just before I agree to accompany you to your mansion, um, maybe we should just introduce ourselves and get acquainted. And uh, I'll start. Hello, my name's Luke, uh, and I'm an English language teacher. Um, I recently got fired because of a misunderstanding. Um, the, uh, the, my boss thought I was being rude to my students. Ridiculous. Um, and uh, um, so he fired me, and it's all a big misunderstanding. I wasn't being rude. I wasn't. It was, um, I don't know how to explain it, because it's just improvisation. But, I, you know, it, I wasn't being rude. Essentially, it's because I was teaching Italian uh, mafia bosses English, and you know you've got to communicate them. You've got to communicate with them in the language that they understand, and that's often with a lot of swear words, um, sort of rude, aggressive, uh, communicative styles. And so I was just, you know, adapting my teaching style for my class. But my boss overheard me telling my students to shut up, and he fired me. He fired me. He fired me for my job, and so um, I was on the streets. So that's my that's my position. I also do a podcast called Luke's English Podcast, which won the Macmillan Award for Best Blog in 2011 and in 2012. So, you know, I, I'm good. I'm a good person, and uh, I'm nice. And, um, yeah, so that's me. My name's Luke, and it's very nice to meet you. Um, what about you, sir? What's your name? Sir, with the moustache and the monocle and the hat. Sir, please, sir, please, sir, sir, what's your name, sir? Can you tell me what your name is, please, sir? And he said, just, Luke, please, just give me a chance to speak. Um, sorry, I, I forgot I have a posh accent. So, my name is uh, Daniel Lazenby Smythe. Daniel Lazenby Smythe, that's right. And I'm very, very posh. I am quite possibly the poshest man in London. And um, it, it is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Mr. Luke. Actually, it's Mr. Thompson, Luke Thompson. Ah, it, I do apologise, Mr. Thompson. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Um, so, wow, Daniel Lazenby Smythe, um, what, what do you do? Um, if you don't mind me asking, what do you do? Well, Luke, I am a collector. I'm a collector of rare, endangered animal species. Um, wow, wow, that sounds interesting. Rare, endangered animal species. What's that? What, what are they? What is it? What, what are you talking about, Daniel? Help! Um, well, rare, endangered animal species. What I do is I travel the globe with um, a huge truck, and I travel around and I search for endangered animal species. These are animals which are very rare, animals which are in danger, animals which are under threat. And I collect them, 
and I put them in the back of the van I st- and I take them to London and then I keep them in my mansion. So, wait a minute, Daniel. So basically you, you steal uh, rare animals from other countries. Yes, basically, yes, Luke, that's what I do. I'm, I just steal animals. But mm, I'm not sure about the ethics of that. Isn't, isn't that a little bit ethically questionable? Um, well, you know, you, you probably do have a point there, Luke, but um, never mind that. Um, let's just keep keep moving forwards with the story, shall we? Yeah, good idea. Okay, right, so let's get in a taxi and let me show you my furry animals. Okay, great, so we got in the taxi. That's the... Got in the taxi. And, um, you know, I started doing this. And Daniel said to me, Luke, why, why are you making that strange noise? Uh, because, um, well, isn't that what you do when you get into a taxi? You, you, you sit down, you put your seatbelt on, you tell the driver where you want to go. Um, the mansion, please, the big mansion in North London. And the driver goes, right, you are, governor, big mansion in North London. Here we go, strap in. And then you go, don't you? And Daniel said, no, no, Luke, no. That's really, that's not necessary, to be honest with you. Not necessary at all. Um, and I'd say to him, well, Daniel, this is my story. I can do what the hell I want. It's my story. Fine, fine, Luke. Yes, you you go ahead. You sit there in the taxi next to me, making a noise like a crazy person. And fine, if you just do whatever you want to do, if you think that it's right, go ahead. After all, you did win those awards and everything, so you must know what you're doing. I do, Daniel, I do, I know what I'm doing, even though I got fired from my job and I've been eating bananas and pretending that they're telephones and things like that. But I know what I'm doing, okay? Trust me, I'm an English teacher. Okay, so off we went to the mansion and we we went past various uh, impressive sites in, in, in London. Driving along the roads, we uh, we drove past Abbey Road Studios because that's in North London. And um, as we drove past, I noticed there were the Beatles. The Beatles were just standing there outside the studio. All four of them. That's right. Even John Lennon, despite the fact he's actually dead, in this story, he was there. He was actually there. So the four Beatles were there. And um, let's see. Ringo was there. Ringo was saying... Um, okay then, Beatles, let's go into the studio and record a new album. And, uh, Paul was like, um, okay, um, all right, uh, John, Ringo, George, ooh, let's, um, let's go into the studio, shall we, and record, uh, a new album. And, uh, jo- George was sort of saying, um, let's see, George, okay, Paul, if you want us to go into the studio, we'll go into the studio. If you don't want us to go in, we won't go in. Um, And Paul's like, well, you know, actually, George, I think we should go into the studio um, because, because it'll be, it'll be great, you know, it'll be like, uh, you know, Sergeant Pepper. And then uh, John said, okay, McCartney, um, I think you've got a good idea. Let's go into the studio and record us another album. And so I overheard all of this as uh, as I went past Abbey Road Studios in the taxi, and I just watched them walking into the studio, and I thought, oh, my God, this is a momentous moment, if that's possible. This is a momentous moment in history. The Beatles have got back together. John Lennon has come back from the dead. They're going into the studio. They're going to record a new album. This is amazing. But I didn't really have a chance to stop the taxi and go into the studio and listen to the music. Um, uh, I thought I didn't have a chance. It turns out uh, I did because I said to Daniel, Daniel! Daniel, wait, let's turn around the taxi. I just saw the Beatles going into a studio uh, to record a new album, a new Beatles album. We've got to go and listen. And Daniel said, well, certainly, Luke, after all, this is your story. You can do whatever the hell you want, and I'm sure you will. Um, And uh, so we turned around the taxi and we went back to the studio and we walked in and um, uh, just sort of walked into the back of the studio and sat down and got ready to listen to Genius in Action. And this is what we heard. Singing, singing a song. Beatles, we're the Beatles and we're geniuses. We haven't lost our 
talent at all because we're still the Beatles genius. And I thought, is that it? Is that is that what they're recording? That is terrible. How on earth? Uh, how on earth could they expect that to be successful? Um, so we just left because it was so rubbish. Um, obviously, they just lost it. They'd lost all their talent um, somewhere along the uh, along the line. So um, anyway, we got back in the taxi, went to the mansion. So we got to the mansion, and uh, Daniel Lazenby Smythe said, "Okay, Luke." In, in a posh voice. Okay, Luke, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you my collection of endangered animals, okay? But you must make two promises to me, two promises which you must keep. Promise number one um, is that you do not touch any of the animals. And promise number two is that you definitely don't touch the animal in the cage at the end of the corridor, okay? Don't touch the animal in the cage at the end of the corridor. I can't uh, emphasize this point more seriously. Please don't touch any of the animals, especially the one in the cage at the end of the corridor. Um, and I thought, okay, all right, Daniel, I agree to your terms. I won't touch any of the animals, especially the animal at the end of the corridor. Now, to be honest, though, I'm... I'm already getting curious about the animal at the end of the corridor, and I'm sure that the listeners uh, are getting curious about it too. Listeners, Luke, what are you talking about? Listeners, there are people listening to this. There's people, people are listening to this? Are you sure? Yes, I'm, I'm positive. Um, I get two to 3,000 downloads every day. A lot of people in the world listen to this. Lots of people li are listening to this? Are you, are you certain? It seems like... Absolute meaningless crap, Luke. Are you sure? Yep, I'm sure. People love this stuff, okay? So just, yeah. Anyway, people are listening, so, so please, let's move on with the story. Yes, yes, okay, don't touch any of the animals. Especially, yeah, I got it, the one at the end of the corridor. Fine, okay. So we went downstairs, we went into the, we went into the mansion, we went downstairs into the basement, and that's where he kept his zoo, his zoo of endangered animals, and he showed me... Uh, he showed me all the animals. There was a kind of a three-headed zebra. Uh, three-headed zebra. That's right. There was um, a, a, a leopard, which had no spots. A leopard, of course, is a kind of a big cat. So a leopard with no spots. I think it was a puma, to be honest. Um, there was also a duck without uh, a beak. A duck without a beak. Poor thing. But it looked strange. It really did. It was like a duck, but just like a round head with no beak on the end. Pretty weird. Uh, all sorts of amazing animals. And then finally, we got to the end of the corridor. And there was a cage at the end with black curtains covering the cage. So I couldn't see what was inside. I couldn't see it. But I, I kind of approached the, the curtains and I listened and I could hear heavy breathing. <sighs> like that and I thought oh my god what is in there I can't wait to see it was like love love me do what on earth could be behind this curtain this is amazing so I started to move the curtain back started to move the curtain back because I wanted to see what kind of weird animal was inside this cage. What kind of fantastic creature could there be in there? I started to move the curtain and Daniel Lazenby Smythe noticed and he said, Luke, stop, stop, do not move the curtain, do not move the curtain. So I said, okay, sorry, Daniel, sorry. And he said, right, with that, I think we should go to bed. And I said, really? We're going to go to bed? Yes, let's go to bed. Um, and I said, well, I, I didn't realise that that was part of the deal. I didn't realise that that's what we'd have to do. No, Luke, no, you misunderstand. I've, you've got your own bedroom. Oh, God, thank God for that. No, Luke, you've got your own bedroom. You'll be sleeping upstairs in the loft. Uh, I will, 
be sleeping in my bedroom, which is in another wing of the house. Nothing to worry about. So with that, we went to our bedrooms and everything. I went upstairs and there was my room. It was fantastic. It was great. There was like a big comfortable bed and an arcade machine in the corner, an old uh, Street Fighter II arcade machine. I hadn't seen one of those for donkey's years. I can't remember the last time I'd seen a Street Fighter II arcade machine. So I went over and... um, and there on the side, there was a pile of coins, which Daniel had thoughtfully left for me, um, and a note, a note written in Daniel's handwriting. And he said, Luke, I know that you're a big fan of computer games, and so I've left you this coin-operated arcade machine of Street Fighter II Championship Edition. And here are some coins so you can play the game. So uh, I put the coins in. I put a coin in and started playing, and I, you know, uh, it asked me to choose my fighter. I chose uh, Ken, because he's the best. And so I started playing, Hadouken, Hadouken, Haryuken, Haryuken. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, this is, a, this is a computer game, a famous computer game, called Street Fighter 2. And I played Street Fighter 2 for ages. Hadouken, Hadouken is what one of the characters says. Yes, I'm not going to talk about that because it's boring for most of you, because I expect most of you have never played Street Fighter 2. I think some of you have. Some of you probably know Street Fighter 2, and you love it. And you're going, yes! Awesome! I can't believe Luke is talking about Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition. Brilliant! But then the rest of you are going, what is Luke talking about? I've got no idea what Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition is. And what, what does he, what's this thing he keeps saying? Hadouken, Haryuken, Tatsumaku Senpyu Kaku. Then, um, never mind. Okay, never mind. Google it. Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition Ken. Just Google that. Then you'll understand what I'm talking about. Right, so I went to bed. I slept so well. Oh, my God. I slept amazingly. And I woke up in the morning all fresh. And Daniel Lazenby Smythe gave me some jobs to do. He got me to clean the the cages of these uh, animals. So I cleaned them out. Didn't touch any of them. No. Cleaned the cages. I was cleaning all day. He gave me a sandwich for lunch. Oh, I was happy. And a banana. And... um, Cleaned the cages, cleaned the cages again, cleaned them again. These cages were so clean by the time I'd finished that um, you could see your own reflection on the floor. That's how clean they were. Uh, I cleaned them into, like, glass. They were so clean. I mean, these were wooden cages, and I cleaned them so much that they became like glass. Yeah, pretty amazing, isn't it? And, um, yeah, and there was that cage at the end of the corridor, tempting me just by its presence just tempting me um asking me look why don't you come and look inside the cage i know you're fascinated um but i you know i didn't i resisted the temptation it was very difficult i wanted to look i wanted to move the curtains aside i wanted to have a look inside i wanted to see what this animal was because i could still hear the noise it was making love and it was very weird (laughs) very very weird indeed but i resisted the temptation i went back upstairs went to bed that night i couldn't sleep couldn't sleep because i was thinking about the animal in the cage downstairs and you know what i did listeners you know what i did uh i did nothing no i didn't do nothing i uh got up i got out of bed and i tiptoed very quietly, silently, I tiptoed down the stairs and um, tiptoed through the basement, past all of the animals which were all sleeping. There was the zebra, you know, making a sort of zebra noise. That's what zebras do when they're sleeping. But it had three heads, so it was like... Three heads. The duck with no beak, just going... Because they couldn't... can't really quack properly, a duck because it didn't have a beak, so it was like sort of going in its sleep, and the leopard and all that stuff, right? And I got to the end of the corridor, and I thought, right, I don't care what Daniel said. I don't care anymore. I just want to see what is in this cage. So I slowly moved the curtains to one side, slowly moved them to one side, and there, at the back of the cage, was a huge pink gorilla. 
just a huge pink gorilla sleeping. And it had a radio as well, listening to the Beatles, actually. So it, there was this huge pink gorilla sleeping, and I, I was stunned. I was absolutely stunned. I couldn't believe my eyes. This massive gorilla, pink, as pink as um, something that's really pink, as pink as a lobster, or as pink as um, just the colour pink. Now, if you can imagine a page in a book, uh, and a child has co coloured it pink with a pink pen, it was pink like that. You know, like the way pink is pink? Well, this gorilla was really pink, okay? And I just thought, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. And um, the, the fur of the gorilla looked so fine and so soft. I just really felt the urge to like reach through the, the, the cage and, and touch its fur. And then I suddenly realised, no, Daniel specifically asked me not to touch this, this animal. So, no, I'm not going to touch it. Um, I really want to touch it, though. I really want to know what it feels like. But I couldn't. So I decided, no, Luke, no. You've done enough tonight. You've investigated enough. It's time to go to bed. So I closed the curtains. I tiptoed back upstairs, tiptoed up the stairs again, and then went back to bed, and I slept uh, like a baby. Um, I didn't, you know, not, I didn't, um, I slept like a baby. That means that I slept very well. It doesn't mean that I kind of cried during my sleep and pissed myself. No, it just means that I ha had a very good night's sleep. I slept like a baby. And in the morning I was happy. I was happy. I cleaned the cages effectively. I cleaned them really well. The, the, the anim all the animals were happy. The zebra with three heads, the duck without a beak, the leopard with no spots, which could also be a puma. And um, I didn't look inside the cage because Daniel was there. You know, Daniel was there whistling. Because <laughs> that's what he does, Daniel. You probably don't know, but during the day... He just whistles. He just sits there enjoying his animal collection and whistling. In a kind of 1950s sort of way. Because no one whistles like that anymore. No one except Daniel Lazenby Smythe. Because he uh, is old fashioned and that's just the way he is. Um, and so I, I didn't, I didn't um, think about the, the pink gorilla. Didn't think about it at all. Until the end of the day. At the end of the day, suddenly when my work was done, I remembered. Luke, what about that pink gorilla, though? What about the pink gorilla? And I thought, God, I, no, I've got to have another look. Because it was so amazing. So Dan, after Daniel had gone to bed, uh, I went uh, down the corridor. And I'm more confident this time. More confident, because I knew what was inside. Opened the curtains, and the gorilla was right there in front of me right there at the, at the bars of the cage. And he went, hello, like that. And I, and I went, oh, like that, shocked. Um, and um, he held out his hand to me, held out his hand. And I knew that he wanted me to touch his hand, right? And I thought, this, this doesn't look so bad. He's quite friendly. And the gorilla was smiling at me with his big teeth, like that, holding his hand out. And... Uh, and I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I don't care about Daniel Lazenby Smythe. I just don't care anymore, damn it. I'm going to touch this gorilla. To hell with the consequences. And so I reached out my hand and I touched the gorilla. And his, his just I touched him briefly on the back of the hand. And his fur felt incredibly soft. It was like the fur of a unicorn. It was so soft. Um, but this huge gorilla suddenly... As soon as I touched him, suddenly he started to go crazy. He started to shake the bars of the cage. He started to run around, jump up and down. He did somersaults. And I thought, oh my God, what have I done? What have I done? And immediately the, the gorilla started to pull the bars open. He started to bend the bars open uh, with this crazy look in his eyes. He pulled the bars open. I thought, oh my God, what have I done? I've got to get out of here. I gotta get out of here in an American accent. Suddenly it became like a kind of an American movie. And I thought, oh my God, get out of there. So I ran. I just ran. I ran out of the mansion. Uh, I didn't bother to, to get any of my stuff. I couldn't. 
couldn't because behind me the gorilla was running. I could hear his footsteps pounding on the ground as he chased after me through the mansion. So I was running through the corridors of the mansion. Oh my God, I've got to run away. This gorilla's going to get me. And I ran and ran. I could hear this gorilla coming towards me. So I ran um, like my life depended on it because I was sure this gorilla was going to rip my head off or something like that. So I just kept running. I ran out into the street and I ran, ran down the street and I turned around to maybe, and I thought, maybe the gorilla... Maybe I lost him because I sort of took a left turn there down an alleyway. Maybe the gorilla, uh, you know, has lost me. And I turned round, but no, the gorilla hadn't lost me. And there he was, sprinting down the road after me in a kind of gorilla style, you know, using his, his hands and his feet running after me. And I, I just thought, oh, my God, what's going on? And um, so I ran. I ran for it. And I found uh, a bicycle on the side of the road, just a... a a bicycle had been left, so I jumped on the bicycle I, and I accelerated. I bombed down the hill, flying down the hill on this BMX bicycle. Um, and um, eventually I got down into the centre of the town and uh, looked round and there was, the, there was the pink gorilla. But he was on a bicycle too. I don't know where he found it. He was flying down the road after me. And so I thought, oh my God, I'm going to need to um, find another form of transport. So I, I quickly jumped onto a bus. I jumped onto one of those red London buses and I went upstairs and I kind of acted all nonchalant as if... Uh, Nothing was happening, so I'm just I'm just getting on a bus. There's nothing to worry about. I'm um, just an ordinary passenger on this uh, lovely red London bus, and I'm just going to sit here and act like nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. Everything's absolutely fine. Maybe if I act normal, the gorilla will will sort of forget who I am, and he'll he'll lose me, and he won't notice, right? So I sat there and I started checking my um, emails on my phone, and. Um, um, I kind of sat there for a while thinking, oh, the gorilla probably doesn't know where I am. I'm okay. After all, I'm on a red London bus. It's safe. Everything's okay. I looked out of the window um, and th looked behind us down the street uh, and immediately I saw the gorilla. And this gorilla was chasing the bus. He was chasing after the bus. He was smashing cars out of his way, just bang, smashing these cars, taxis, black taxis, uh, uh, vans, trucks, just smashing them all out of his way in his mission to get me. And, you know, I nearly um, soiled my trousers, I'll be honest, because I thought everything was all right, but no, it wasn't. The gorilla was more determined to get me than ever, and he was just chasing after me. So I jumped out of the... Uh, jumped out of the bus and I thought I'm going to need to um, I'm going to need to to get uh, on another form of transport so I, I sort of dived into the underground um, and uh, I was in such a rush I got up to the gates I got up to the ticket gates but of course there was this woman in front of me she couldn't find her oyster card she was checking her pockets um and uh i said like, come on come on for god's sake there's a huge pink gorilla chasing after me he's going to kill me can you just get through the gates please and the woman was like excuse me excuse me but i'm trying to get i'm trying to find my oyster card i don't need you i don't need you like telling me what to do yeah i don't care if you've got a pink gorilla chasing after you i've i can't find my oyster card well look sorry but couldn't you have looked for your oyster card before you got here this is the worst place to be D didn't you listen to my podcast about using the underground you shouldn't you know you shouldn't do this you should be prepared when you get to the gates. You should have your oyster card ready. Look, look, Luke. You know, I know you. I know you've done a podcast about that, but I don't care right now. I don't care, do I? I just don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I get the message. I think you don't really care. Fine. Never mind. So I, I went to the next gate and I, I got my oyster card and I went through. Managed to get down onto the platform. The train came in. Uh, jumped on the train, and um, the train left. And, and the announcement said, this is a Cockfosters. No, the announcement said, this is a Piccadilly line train to Cockfosters, calling at South Kensington and Piccadilly Circus. 
Um, and so I thought, right, good, I'm on the Piccadilly line, going to Cockfosters. Um, what am I going to do? I guess I can go to, I could probably go to Stansted Airport if I change at Green Park onto the Victoria line, and then I take the Victoria line sort of northbound and then go to Tottenham Hale, and from Tottenham Hale I can jump on the overland, which will take me to Stansted Airport, and then I can just get a plane out of here, and that pink gorilla is never going to find me. So I, um, you know, I did that, took the underground, and I thought, this is fine, the gorilla can't chase me on the underground, this is fine, no problem. And for a while I thought everything was all right. I thought, I've got a plan, everything's going to be fine. Um, I, cha- I changed onto the Victoria Line. I went to, to uh, Tottenham Hale Station, got out, um, walked through the streets, nothing. No pink gorilla. Everything was fine, everything was calm, um, nothing to worry about. And so I kind of walked leisurely in a relaxed way. I walked to the station to get the overland train, got on the overland train, sat down, relaxed. Um, I thought, this is going to be nice. I'm going to go on holiday somewhere. This is going to be great. Um, and I was just relaxing, sitting back in my seat. I looked to, to my right, and there, on the tracks next to the train, as the train was going along the tracks, then on the, the, the next set of tracks, there was the fucking pink gorilla. There he was, and he was on one of those like mechanical train things you know those things that's like a platform with um, a kind of metal handle metal bar in the middle which you can lift up and down and it sort of uh, it's a mechanical device which allows you to travel along the train tracks just by moving this bar up and down so he was on one of those things moving it up and down up and down and flying along next to the train uh, and uh, I was so shocked I just looked at him I just couldn't stop looking at him. And the gorilla turned to me, just there on, on the tracks, you know, flying along the tracks, moving the bar up and down. He turned to me, and he just mouthed, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you, he mouthed. Um, understandably, I was shocked, and I was afraid. Um, and, whew, dear, that was frightening. So what happened was, I got out of the train near the airport and I realised oh my god I don't have any money the, uh, while I was doing this I don't know what the pink gorilla was doing he was probably putting the uh, train um, platform mechanical device thing somewhere probably maybe maybe had to deal with a member of train staff he said oh, excuse me excuse me uh, excuse me Mr Gorilla Mr Pink Gorilla uh, do you mind if I ask what you're doing um, that is um, British rail property you're not supposed to be touching that and the gorilla probably went, well, I don't care, Squire, I don't care what you think, because I'm a bloody pink gorilla, yeah? And I am on a mission to get that geezer over there called Luke Thompson. I'm going to get him, yeah? I am going to get him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mug him right off. You will see, my friend. And so the, the guy was like, OK, sorry, you're a bit frightening. You're a little bit scary, and you're a huge pink gorilla. I'm not going to give you any trouble. In fact, I don't know, would you like a banana? I don't eat no bananas, mate. Or I don't eat. I've only got one mission, and that is to get that geezer over there called Luke. I am going to get him. Now, get out of my way. So the gorilla was involved in something, which meant I had a little bit of time. And I thought... Damn, I don't have any money to pay for a ticket. What am I going to do? And so I went into the bank um, in order to, to borrow some money. So I went to the bank to borrow some money and I got an appointment with the bank manager in his office. Um, and so the bank manager said to me, OK, uh, Mr. Thompson, um, would you like to take a seat? Um, so I said, yeah, great, thanks. Thanks. Ooh, just sit down. <laughs> Everything's OK. Just sit down here. Ah, oh, that's nice. Nice, comfortable seats you have in the bank here, Mr. Manager. Yes, um, that's right. Yes, we do have comfortable seats, Luke. Now, uh, how can I help you? Well, um, I'd like to, uh, like to borrow some money, please. I'd like to take out a loan. And the, the bank manager said, well, OK, fine. Um, how much money would you like to borrow? Um, and I said, well, I'd like to, if possible, I'd like to borrow, well, as much as, as, much as you can. In fact, I'd like to borrow all, all the money, just all of it all the money. Well, Luke, uh, I'm sure you realise that um, we can't just simply lend you all the money, uh, all the money in the bank. No, 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 I don't expect you to lend me all the money in the bank. No, I just want you to lend me all the money. 
just all the money in the world. Uh, well, Luke, uh, um, I understand you're a humorous gentleman. You're, you're, uh, you like to have a laugh, but seriously, that's impossible. That's ridiculous. Um, we, we could probably lend you about £3,000 uh, with an interest rate of, well, 6%. Um, well, sorry, Mr. Bank Manager, but I think you'll find... I know that you, you're the manager of this big bank and it's all very important and all that kind of stuff. Well done, congratulations. Clap, clap, clap. Good job. Yeah, you're brilliant. Um, but I think you'll find that um, this story... Um, and everything in it, including you, um, uh, is basically the creation of my brain. Okay, so uh, you can't tell me that you can't give me all the money. Okay, because um, this is my story. So basically, if I wanted to, I could make you say and do anything I wanted. And the bank manager was like, "Oh, really? Um, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I think you're making it up." Um, Prove it. So I said, OK, fine. If you want me to prove it, I'm going to prove it. Um, OK, Mr. Bank Manager, I'm going to make you speak um, like Sean Connery now. Ha, don't be ridiculous, Luke. You can't make me speak like Sean Connery. What the? Oh, my God. You, you, you've made me speak like Sean Connery. This is, this, is, uh, this is strange. This is unbelievable. In fact, this is amazing. I've always wanted to speak uh, like Sean Connery. To be honest, you're sounding a bit Dutch, really. Uh, never mind, Luke. Uh, I don't care if I sound Dutch. Uh, essentially, this is a Sean Connery voice, and you've made me speak like this. Okay, never mind. Um, let's say... I, 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 I don't think you're convinced yet. Let's say I want you to speak like uh, Roger Moore. Okay. Oh, you want me to speak like Roger Moore. Uh, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, okay, let's say you're going to speak like... Um, you're going to speak like a scouser. You're going to speak like someone from Liverpool now, Mr. Bank Manager, and then you're going to believe that uh, I'm in control of this story and everything that happens in it. Um, all right, Luke. All right, so you want to you wanna borrow some money? How much money do you want to borrow? Oh, yeah, you told me, didn't you? You want to borrow all the money? Um, yes, that's right. I do want to borrow all the money. Uh, Mr. Bank Manager, who speaks with a Mancunian accent from Manchester. All right, Luke, all right, how's it going? All right, do you want to borrow some money or something, yeah? You do, don't you? All right, let, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do, yeah? I'll give you a, I'll give you a card, right, and I'll have all... all this accent's gone wrong. Yes, that accent has gone wrong. Let's just say that you speak normally, okay? And then I think you'll agree that um, you can give me all the money, right? Because this is a story which I've created. Um, yes, okay, Luke, you've, you've convinced me. Um, you've convinced me that you're in control of the story. I'm going to give you all the money. Would you like that in £10 notes or £20 notes? Um, well, um, can you give me in 20s? Certainly, Luke. Um, have you got um, a container of some kind? Uh, because <clears throat> all the money in £20 notes, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. Uh, well, is there any way you could just give me like a credit card um, and then I don't have to carry cash? Is that possible? Yes, certainly, Luke. Yes, we can arrange for you to, to have a card. How about a debit card? Yes, debit card would be fantastic. Right. In fact, could you hurry up? Because, uh, to be honest, I'm being chased by a huge pink gorilla, and uh, I expect that it's, uh, it's nearly uh, caught up with me now. He's probably outside the bank waiting for me. So, please, can you hurry up and just get me the card, and then I'll be on my way, OK? Certainly, Luke, certainly. It's been a pleasure uh, doing business with you, and I'm very glad that you're our customer, even though you're going to take all the money. That's right, all the money in the world. Yes, well, I'm going to need it, because I think this pink gorilla is a dangerous uh, one, and so I'm going to need money. I'm going to need some cash to help me get out of this difficult situation. I think you'll agree. And the bank manager said, OK, Luke, look, this, th we've been in the bank too long in this part of the story, so it's time that we moved on, isn't it? Don't you think? Yes, it is, bank, bank, bank manager. OK, thanks for your help. Great, got the card. Great, thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye. And he said, OK, Luke, it was really good to do business with you. Bye, 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 bye. So, bang, out into the street again. 
and I thought, you know what? I'd really love a Starbucks. I would love a Starbucks. I wonder if there's a Starbucks nearby somewhere. <laughs> yes, there's a Starbucks right there, right next to me, of course. So I went into Starbucks, got myself a coffee, didn't I? Yeah. Got myself a uh, skinny gingerbread latte mocha frappuccino um, on ice. And I got that, and uh, I drank that. And then uh, I thought, what am I doing? Um, what am I doing? I can't remember. That's it. I'm escaping from this pink gorilla, which is going to try and kill me. And with that, I looked down the street, and there was the pink gorilla, finally, just um, flying down the street towards me on a skateboard. Um, and I thought, oh, God. Oh, my God, he's on a skateboard. Oh, God. So what I did was I got a scooter. I just stole a scooter from a child. Sorry. I didn't really. It's just a story. I stole a scooter from a child and said, Come here, Johnny, little Johnny. Give me a scooter. I don't care if uh, you're a child. I don't care if this is a, if this is a criminal act. It's just a story, okay, Johnny? Um, in fact, <laughs> magic. There's a, there's a new scooter. So you can have that one, and I'll take your old one, okay? Okay, mister. Okay, mister, you can take my scooter. Thanks a lot. Bye, 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 bye. So <laughs> I, I escaped down the street towards the airport on a scooter with the pink gorilla flying behind me on a skateboard. It was dramatic. We got to the airport. I got there first, flew into the airport on my scooter, got to the counter, boom, give me a ticket to um, somewhere else, please, on, on an aeroplane. Take, give me an aeroplane ticket. I want to leave as soon as possible. And the woman said, OK, sir, um, you can have a, this ticket here. Uh, there you go, that'll be £150,000. £150,000? Yes, Luke, £150,000, but after all, you have got all the money. Um, so it's not, not a problem, really. No, it's not. How did you know that I had all the money? Never mind that, Luke, never mind. Um, I think that uh, I think there's a pink gorilla chasing you, so you might want to just you know, keep moving. Yeah, you're right, thanks. Thanks very much. So I took the ticket and I went through the airport, went through security control... That was a bit annoying. I had to stand in a queue. Um, and uh, so I was standing in the queue, waiting to go through the x-ray machine. The pink gorilla was just standing behind me. And he was like, this is a bit of, bit boring, isn't it? This uh, security control. What a, and they don't even let you bring water onto the plane. <laughs> no, they don't do. Oh, oh it's, it's annoying. Anyway, that's the modern world. Bloody terrorists. Oh. Um, and got through security. And then the pink gorilla was like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be chasing you, aren't I? I was like, yes, yes, you are. Um, so with that I ran away from him and uh, jumped onto the plane and I managed to jump on before the pink gorilla got there the plane taxied out onto the runway and flew, uh, flew off it took off and uh, I thought ah oh, finally finally I'm in the air I'm safe ironically this is the safest place flying in air in the air in a huge metal uh, um, aeroplane I couldn't be safer um, and so there I was in the sky ah, just sort of relaxing I ordered um, a martini shaken, not stirred and uh, drank it and I looked out of the window I thought this is great I'm flying to a new exotic destination um, this is going to be great no problem at all and I looked out at the window and there on the wing on the wing of the aeroplane you guessed it there was an engine. But next to the engine, there was a pink gorilla. The pink gorilla was holding on to the wing of the aeroplane as we were flying. Just holding on like that, looking at me, staring at me, smiling with his big teeth. And, and I thought, oh my God, oh Jesus, he's managed to catch up with me. And he's even hanging on to the, the wing. This is terrible. So uh, th eventually the aeroplane landed and we landed in the North Pole. That's right, the North Pole. Um, it was pretty cold up there, pretty cold on the North Pole. We landed and uh, immediately I just ran. I just ran straight out of the aeroplane, just ran off into the snow, and I just kept running through the snow, running, 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 running. I was a bit cold, but I was all right because I was running. So I was running, 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 kept running, and I managed to jump um, onto an iceberg. 
I jumped onto an iceberg. That's like a big mountain of ice just floating in the water. I ran, I jumped onto the iceberg, looked over my shoulder, um, and the pink gorilla was running through the snow as well. He jumped onto the iceberg. So I, I jumped off that iceberg and jumped onto another iceberg, and the pink gorilla followed me, and I kept jumping from iceberg to iceberg, iceberg to iceberg until eventually I was stuck on a little iceberg just stuck floating in the water in, in, at the North Pole and the gorilla was there and he just walked up towards me he, he just he, he jumped over onto the iceberg and he just walked up towards me and I thought oh my god this is it this is it this is the end of my life <laughs> oh oh dear I, not now please no I'm not ready to go not yet and the pink gorilla walked up to me and he he extended his hand again his huge pink arm extended towards me and it, i thought he was going to rip my head off but his hand slowly moved towards me and he just tapped me on the arm and he said tag you're it and i went what i don't, what do you mean he said tag tag you're it what tag mate tag you're it um, it's a game, isn't it? It's a game. It's just a, it's a game. Um, and I said, what about your accent? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a game. It's a game, Squire. It's just a game. It's a children's game. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I expect the listeners at this point have got no idea what's going on. But, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, tag. It's a game. It's like a, a game you play when you're a children in the, in the playground at school. You, you touch someone and you say tag and then you're it. And if you're it, you have to chase other people, and you touch them, and uh, and then they're it, and they have to chase you. So he said, yeah, exactly, tag, you're it. I said, what, is that it? He said, yep, that's it. And he just, with that, he turned around and ran in the opposite direction. And there I was, just floating on this iceberg in the North Pole, and I just thought, oh my God, he didn't want to kill me. It was just a game of tag. What a disappointment this story is. That was it. It was just a huge game of tag. So the pink gorilla was just competitive. He just enjoyed playing games. Oh, I'm so stupid. Why did I even touch him in the first place? What an idiot I am. I wish I'd never done it in the first place. But then I thought, well, it is a game of tag after all, so I better chase him. So I sort of stood up, picked myself up off the ground, brushed the snow off my trousers, and I thought, right, I'm going to get that gorilla. And with that, I jumped from iceberg to iceberg to iceberg, back to the airport, and I could see the pink gorilla getting on the plane. And so I leapt onto the wing, and the plane took off into the sunset. Um, and our game of tag continued um, forever. Uh, and now, as I tell you this story, um, I'm just taking a break from the, the game of tag. And I'm just sitting here. I managed to find time to record an episode of Luke's English Podcast. And you've been listening to it, ladies and gentlemen. So thanks very much for listening. And uh, I hope that um, somehow you enjoyed listening to this random story. Um, I'm sure that you'll find that uh, listening to this has been an experience. It's certainly been good for your English. It's very important to listen to things like this in English from time to time. Now, if you want to, you can suggest additions to the story. What do you think happened next in the story of the pink gorilla? Maybe there are some aspects to the story which uh, I didn't deal with. In which case, feel free to leave a comment underneath this uh, podcast. If you have any questions, of course, you can leave comments again. And... Um, uh, you will uh, hopefully get answers to those questions eventually. So please uh, keep visiting the websites and do uh, write your questions or comments there. But for now, for this episode of Luke's English Podcast, it's goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. 